Welcome to Pathway, we're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we wanna say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word give to our text number or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here. As we start out and we sing some songs this morning, I want to read for us out of Psalms 33 and allow this scripture to just reorient our perspectives we walk in because we can walk in carrying heavy things. We can walk in not feeling that God is great, but we have an opportunity to worship in word and in song and remembering who he is and who sits on the throne. It says this in Psalm 33, it says, Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of 10 strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's put our hands together as we worship this morning. Let's praise our Father. out together let praise be a weapon let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety let it rise let praise arise we sing your name in the dark and it changes everything Breakthroughs on our side Forever lift you up 
the battle, you see the victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain moon. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Nothing to fear now, for I am saved with you. Let's sing this out together this morning. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. Oh. There's nothing impossible So as we continue to sing, now we're going to sing about the faithfulness of God, his goodness in our life. And I think sometimes there's, there's something coming back to a scripture that is so familiar that sometimes when we walk in carrying different things and we walk through different seasons of life, sometimes a scripture just hits us in a different way. And so this morning I want to read for us the 23rd Psalm, but I would invite you just to take a second, close your eyes, remove all the worry and the heaviness maybe that you walked into or the distractions that are gripping you right now. And let's just think about these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's think about that as we continue to sing this morning.
thank you for allowing us to be here and worship with you. We love singing about your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord. I'm just so thankful um, that you are always with us and that you are a God that keeps your promises and you promise to always be with us no matter where we are. I thank you that you go before us, you comfort us. And Lord, I just pray that you would, as the scripture said, just restore our souls. We love you, dear Father, and it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. My name is Kyle Howard. I'm one of the middle school pastors here on staff, and I'm here with Pastor Amanda Miller, and we are excited to tell you about some changes and opportunities coming to Impulse this fall. Impulse is our middle school ministry here at Pathway, and we are super excited for what's to come. And so August 18th, we are gonna be kicking off a Wednesday night Impulse service, and we are so excited for this. We're gonna have worship, we're gonna have fun together, we're gonna have teaching and small groups. This is really gonna become the hub of what we do with our middle schoolers throughout the week. We think it's so important for us to, to be together, for students in middle school to have an incredible leader who pours into their life to connect with other uh, followers of Jesus throughout the week. And so we're super excited for what's to come on Wednesday nights. Now that doesn't mean we're not gonna be still meeting on the weekends. We're actually still gonna be gathering. And Amanda is gonna share with you a little bit about what that's gonna look like. Yeah, so we didn't wanna get rid of weekend services altogether for Impulse. And so what we are gonna do is actually transition it into more of a digging deeper style service. And so we'll still gather as middle school students in the Impulse room, uh, but we're gonna really be focused in on our biblical knowledge, really building up what we know about the Bible, how to read the Bible, and diving deeper into the truths that we can find there. And so we're really excited. We hope your students still join us on the weekends. Uh, but like Kyle said, Wednesday night nights are really going to be the heart of our ministry moving forward. So again, we're super excited for what's to come. So August 18th, Wednesday nights from 6.15 to 7.45, we want your students to be there. We believe it's going to be awesome and we believe God has awesome things in store for our middle school students. We'll see you guys then. Well, good morning. Hey, you guys are awake. That's great. Uh, well, uh, my wife and I have a middle schooler uh, now, which I know is a shocker to you probably because I look like I'm a, like a stunning 23, uh, but it's not true. And, and anyway, we are uh, recipients of like, it, it's such a blessing, this team, they're so fantastic. So we can't encourage you enough if you have a middle schooler to have them um, be a part of that. Uh, well, my name is Dan Lettweiler. I'm one of the pastors here at Pathway. I get the privilege of pastoring the venue community with Gordon uh, Knapp upstairs and we just love what God is doing up there. If you've never tried the venue, you should check it out sometime. Uh, and I also get the privilege of working with life groups and life group leaders. And as we move into the fall, I may just encourage you, if you are not connected uh, with other folks growing in Jesus Christ and your journey together, then you need to do that. It's so important. It has been one of the biggest blessings and encouragements uh, to my wife and I and my personal spiritual growth um, in the last couple of years. So I just want to encourage you to be a part of that. Well, we are going to jump into James chapter 2, uh, just continuing on with what we've talked, over the uh, talked about over the last um, couple of weeks. But before we do that, I just want to continue. As we've been praying all morning. I just want to continue um, just that attitude of prayer as we open Scripture together, if you join me. Jesus, I just ask that as we, as we open your word, that you will be faithful, God, that you will, um, as you say, that your word will not return void. So we just ask that you, I just ask that the words that I share would be the words that you would have me share God, it would be clear, it would be concise, and God, that you will encourage us. God, will you inspire us? Will you challenge us and convict us? God, will you just work through the power of your Holy Spirit and help me be part of that. Help us to do that together in this time. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, in James chapter 2, if you have an electronic device or an actual paper Bible in front of you, I'm using my ESV study journal that has scripture on the one side. That's what I'll be using. Um, grab that, open it up to James chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 26. And we're just going to continue walking through what we've walked through over the last several weeks. And it's just, as we're talking about this practical wisdom from James that allows us to have a powerful witness. We believe that these ways of actually living that James is talking to, because he's talking to a Christian community, um, are going to help us live in such a way that we're a better reflection of Jesus Christ, and that our witness that we have with other people actually means something. The words that we share, if we share them, we'll, we'll have weight to them. 
So a couple of reminders as we look at James for context. He is talking to Christians, right? And James is someone that grew up in a traditional Jewish home. He's the half-brother of Jesus. He's the son of Joseph and Mary. And so he is well acquainted with the, with the Old Testament patriarchs and Abraham and all the, the ways of living Jewish culture, your, your culture and your religion and everything is very much tied together. And James is, has grown up with all of that. But he also has kind of this, this new change on things because he has everything he's grown up with. And then Jesus, who he knew very well, is he, he comes to understand Jesus as the Messiah, as the promised Messiah from Jewish scripture. And so James is writing to these Christians, these Jewish Christians that are now scattered, and he's writing with that, those things in mind, with that context in mind. So in the first book, I just want to jump uh, and kind of draw a correlation for us real quick. In the first book of Acts, and we talked about Acts a couple months ago, um, Luke opens up that book by saying this. He says, in, in the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up. And I think James is going to bring that exact same approach for us um, today in the, in the passage that we're going to look at because maybe just being so close to Jesus, he understood that there's, it's not just what Jesus taught, but it's how Jesus lived, what Jesus did that was important. It was those two things together. And that's what James is going to argue over and over and over again until he feels like he's made his point completely clear in the passage that we're going to look at, that there's some things that just have to go together, that belong together. So to get us into that, I thought we would have a little participation. Are you up for that? That's great, because I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, so uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put some words on the screen, and I'm going to say the first word, and you'll get it. So, like, these are things that should go together, like cinnamon and, okay, Oreos, salt, bacon, uh, everything. Oh. <laughs> Who said, I like you? All right, that's my guy. That's good. Peanut butter and, okay, macaroni, ketchup, peas. Ah, so I'd say peas and carrots. I was going to do like a, an impression, like peas and Jenny, like peas. Okay. Uh, anybody? Okay. Uh, Siegfried and, man. All right. Uh, Bert and, Sonny and, Beavis and, don't say it. Oh, oh. We're in church, guys. All right. Let's see about this one. Guys named Tom Selleck and, yes, mustaches. Nobody got it last night. Anybody? Tom Selleck's mustache has a Facebook page, just so you know. I found it. Okay, and then if you get this one, then we are lockstep together mentally. Sushi and? Uh, it's sci-fi. Anybody? They go together. If you don't believe me, you're wrong. Okay, so this is what James is talking about to his readers. He's saying there are some things that go together. And he's been arguing this, I would, I would say, maybe even since the beginning of the book. Um, some of the other pastors have preached about this the last couple of weeks. James 1, he says, we are to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So as we hear the word, as we soak that in, we also have to do it. Uh, in James 1, he says, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, the, this person's religion is worthless. So he's saying the religion that you have has to be tied with some action, like right? you have to bridle your tongue. If you're not bridling your tongue, your works and your religion, uh, and it's, it's not, it doesn't work if they don't go together. And we'll do one more. Uh, James 1, 27. He says, the kind of religion that's pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So if you're tracking with me, he's saying, listen, the kind of religion, the kind of belief, the kind of faith that, that actually is worthwhile, that's, that's real, that's genuine, the kind of stuff that pleases God is to, has some actions tied to it. The idea of visiting orphans and widows in their affliction and keeping oneself unstained from the world. As James is writing uh, in this next set of verses that we're going to look at, he's going to use two words over and over again. He's going to bounce back and forth um, between them. And as he's doing that, it sounds like he's either having some kind of argument or discussion with somebody else, like they've said something and they're not really speaking here, but it's just James kind of responding back and forth to them. Or he just wants to make his point really clear. And so he's going to write, as he's writing this letter, he's arguing both sides of the argument. And he's, he's kind of playing devil's advocate with himself. I don't know which one it is. It doesn't really matter. His point is made either way. I just want you to like, as we read this, you're going to read it um, that way. Okay, here are the two words that James is going to talk about over and over again that we're going to define as we jump into them because I think it will change um, the way that we read this passage of Scripture. And I would even encourage you guys, uh, after, after this morning, 
to take this passage of Scripture and kind of insert these two definitions every, instead of the words every time you read it. And it, I, I did it this week a couple times, and my, my brain was like, pow, pow. okay, all right. So the first word is this, is faith. Uh, the Greek, and now Ken Snyder said this a couple weeks ago. He said he wasn't a Greek scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I've kind of poured over this over the last two weeks. So this is, I think, the best definition we have this morning that we can, I can give you, is that faith is an inbirthing of trust that God's will and God's way is best by the Spirit of God. It's this gift. Every time I read it, it said this is a, faith is this gift that God gives us. He inbirths this belief and trust that his will and his way is, is right, that his will and his way is best. And it's this idea that God, that God gives this thing to us. And then works is an action that completes an inner desire or intention. When James is talking about works in this passage, often he's, he's talking to the Christian community. He's talking about good deeds done. He's talking about good deeds done to other folks in the Christian community. But it, it, in the essence, what works comes down to, it's I have an intention to do something and I actually do it. I have the intent to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and I put peanut butter and jelly on bread and I put it together and I eat it. Like I have the desire or the intention to do something and I finish that desire with a work or an action. So as God in births trust that his will and his way is best, it's fulfilled, James is gonna say, by, by trusting that, having an intention to obey what God says and then actually following through with that intention. Okay, let's jump into verse 14 together is where we're going to start. Uh, James says this. He says, what good is it, my brothers? So he's talking to, to Christians here. What good is it if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? So what James is going to ask, and this word, what good is it, is ophelos, it means what's the benefit? Like what's the advantage? Do you gain anything by saying that you have faith and you don't have works? And James is asking an extremely rhetorical question at this point in the letter. Right? He, he, he's assuming that the answer is going to be this glaring no. Now, I do not, I, I used to like spicy stuff. I can't eat spicy stuff anymore, okay? I said Salt and pepper, it's, all, it's just salt. I'm, it's really sad for me because I can't eat spicy stuff. If, if one of you said to me, hey, Dan, how about like we go to Buffalo Wild Wings after services today and they have like for $10, you can eat all the habanero, chili pepper, chili flake, red pepper flake covered wings that you can eat for $10. Doesn't that sound great? I would say, no, that sounds like a terrible idea because I think I would die. I don't want to do that. That's what James is saying. He's like, no, absolutely not. That's preposterous. That's his response to can that kind of faith save someone? He's saying, if you have faith, but there are no works tied to it, can that kind of faith save? And James is like, no, there's no way. Okay, and he's going to continue to explain his point here in verse 15. He says, if a brother, again, a brother or sister, so this is someone else in the Christian community, if they're poorly clothed and they're lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? And then he says in 17, so also faith is by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So the picture that James is painting for us is one of this. In our day and age, it would be, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you live here, in, let's say you live in Pine Valley, right? It's real close. You live in Pine Valley, and there's another person that goes to Pathway, and they actually live in Pine Valley too. And your kids go to Oakview, and their kids go to Oakview. And you, you attend Pathway, and this is your church home, and you're actually in a life group. And guess what? This other person is in your same life group. So you know them. You know them really well. You know their face, their name. You know their story. You guys have done life together. You've, you've traveled together and journeyed together spiritually. And it comes to your attention that that person is in need. Like they actually don't have the clothes that they, to really cover themselves that they need on a, and they don't have the food that they need on a daily basis because situations and things have happened in their life. He, James is saying, in the same way, what good would it be to go to that person and say, man, like, whew, that's, that's a tough one. But you know what? I, I just pray God's best over you and be warmed and, and filled. Okay, see you later. And you walked away. He's saying that would be of no benefit Whatsoever, because what they're, what, what they're actually saying here, the way that this, this would have read to their community, the, what the phrase that James is saying, go in peace, be warmed and filled, is saying the same thing as, is may, is may God grant whatever, whatever you wish. This, it's the go in peace is this, this, thing they would, this blessing they would have said over people. It's maybe, may, may God grant whatever you wish or whatever you need, your deepest needs and desires. May God grant those. And may you be completely warmed by God and may you be completely filled up to the full by God. It was like this really pious statement but that had nothing to back it. And James is saying in verse 17, so also faith, 
if it's by itself but doesn't have works is dead. He's saying that statement would be an empty statement in the same way faith that doesn't have works is dead. Verse 18 is where we're going to pick up. And then he says, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one. You do well. Like, like that's good. But even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And so what James is going to continue, in, and when, when, we, when I read this, like, several times, I didn't pick up on what, what, the, what the people that would have read this James' original audience, the things that they would have picked up on automatically when they read this. Because I read this, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm tracking with you, faith without works, and show me your faith by your works. And then he's, in verse 19, when he says, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. I'm like, okay, yeah, God is one. Like, I agree with that. And I understand the demons could understand that, but not believe in God. But that phrase, you believe God is one, to this Jewish audience, they would have been hearing a phrase that instantly would have taken them to the Shema. And this is this Hebrew prayer that comes out of the Torah. It's like the most, is my understanding, it's like the most ancient of the Hebrew prayers that they would have known. And they would have said this in the morning. They would have said it in the afternoon. They would have said it in the evening. They probably said it every time they left their home. They probably said it every time they came back into their home. It may have been written on a scroll that they kept on the, the doorpost of their house. Sometimes they would put it on a scroll and they'd have it in a little case that they would wear around their neck or on their head. They knew this phrase. So by James saying this, he's, he's just like instantly drawing everybody into like the most traditional Jewish phrase that they could possibly know. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. It comes out of Deuteronomy 6, 4. He's saying, listen guys, you believe that God's one. You believe the Shema. That's great. Like you have faith that, that God exists. But then he says, but just believing that God is one is no really, is no different than the demons because he said even the believe, demons understand and believe that there is one God and that he is the Lord. And at least they have, and it almost sounds like James is saying, and at least they have the good respect to shudder when they think about that phrase. So he's really kind of laying it on, but he's saying there's a difference between saying, I know who God is, or I agree that God is who he says he is. There's a difference between that and saying, okay, I know who God is, and I believe he is who he says he is, and I also just want to say that, like, I just want to make Jesus my Lord. And I want to submit my life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so as Jesus says, I need to do this, I want to be obedient to what Jesus says. And as Jesus says, this is how I'm supposed to live, and this is what the pattern of my life is supposed to look like, and how I'm supposed to respond, and how I'm supposed to lean into his spirit. I want to be obedient to that. There's a difference between I know who God is, and I'm surrendering my life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then James says in verse 20, if your faith has no works then it's useless. He said, can it save? No, he's saying, if, if it's like this, it's actually dead. And he said, if it has no works, it's also useless. Okay, so I was tracking with James through all that. And then he said, and then he gives us a couple examples. He's like, let me illustrate this for you in a way that's gonna help you understand by, by stories of real people that I'm gonna bring in. And so in, starting in verse 21, he says, was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him his righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So he brings in the story of Abraham. This is going to take us to Genesis 22 and I want to kind of recap the story of Abraham and Sarah and their son Isaac. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we're going to jump into the story of Rahab with, with James, and then we're going to come back to this idea that I just want to kind of put a pin in something that I got stuck on this last week, and it's the, it's the word justif justified. Because I'm, I'm tracking with James on faith and works, and then he throws in the word justified, and I've always understood it to mean one thing, and then he puts it here, and I got really confused. So if you're confused about that right now, I'm just going to say I'm coming back to it. Don't worry, okay? It'll be all right. All right, so Genesis 22. Here's the story that he's talking about, about Abraham. In Genesis 22, Abraham was 99 years old and his wife Sarah was 90. Okay, they're not like super young at the time. And God goes to them and they have no children. And he says, you're gonna have a son. And their response, which probably might be natural for any 99 and 90 year old couple, was laughter. They were like, oh, that's, that's cute. Like, are you kidding me? Like, and God's like, no, seriously, you, you guys are gonna have a son. And through him, you're going to, Abraham, you're going to be the father of many 
nations, not just like a nation or not just a family, but many nations to this one son. And God proves himself faithful because he is, because that's who he is. And some time later, uh, time passes and Sarah becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son who they name Isaac. And then it says in, in Genesis 22 that some time later, so some time passes from what I've listened to and studied a little bit this week. I think maybe he could be like between a teenager. Maybe he's 20 years old. I heard someone say, so maybe Isaac, let's say Isaac is 20 years old this time. And then God goes to Abraham and tells him to sacrifice his son Isaac as a burnt offering. And that's for like the, like the record scratch. I mean, I, like this has to be a really confusing point for Abraham because it's through this one son, the only son that he has, that he's, that he's now over 100 years old and his wife is probably at least 100 now, right? And he's going to have, he has this one son and through him, he's going to be the father of many nations. And then God says, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. And Abraham's response is amazing because early the next morning, it said Abraham took Isaac and two servants and he started on his journey towards a place where the Lord told him to go. It's a three-day journey, and they arrive after three days, and Abraham and Isaac um, go up to the place alone. He, he tells the servants, you stay here, and we will come back um, after we go up to worship. So Abraham goes up with Isaac alone. Isaac is carrying the wood for the burnt offering. And if you're, like, there's so many cool pictures in this that point forward towards Jesus in this in this narrative, it's amazing. Um, but Isaac and, and Abraham go up. Isaac is carrying the wood for the burnt offering. And then on their way up, Isaac has this conversation. And, I, and as I read this, I think maybe it's because I'm like, if I put myself in Abraham's shoes, I'm thinking this is like the most quiet three-day road trip I've ever taken in my entire life. I am doing nothing but praying and thinking and wrestling and talking to the Lord and trying to figure things out. And I maybe... Isaac asks this question of Abraham because Abraham has just been like stone silent the whole time. And he says, uh, they're walking up and Isaac says, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Kind of like, dad, we didn't even bring it from home. We didn't get something on the way here. And Abraham's response is, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And then Abraham builds the altar and he puts the wood on it. Again, I'm just, if I picture this, like laying out like how it happened. I'm wondering if this is like the most meticulous altar building Abraham has ever done. And he's putting the wood on it just like perfectly. And then he binds his son Isaac and lays him on the altar on top of the wood. And then no doubt with like a shaking hand, Abraham grabs uh, the knife to slay his son. And it's at this point that the angel of the Lord calls out, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him because now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. The Lord knew Abraham's intent, right? His intention was to follow through with the work that God had called him to. He'd done everything completely obediently uh, to a T. And Abraham looks up to see a ram caught by its horns in a thicket and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son, Isaac. And no doubt there was like a party like no party up there on the hill as they were ready to sacrifice between Abraham and Isaac, tears shed and everything. And then Hebrews 11, uh, verses 17 through 19. Sometimes we kind of call this like, instead of like a hall of fame, sort of like a hall of faith. It's this list of faithful people that have leaned into God in, in, in really neat ways. It gives us a deeper picture into Abraham's heart and mind here. And it says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice he who had embraced the promise, the promise that God had given him to say the promise of you will be a father of many nations. Abraham, who had embraced that promise, was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned, right? It's through Isaac that you're going to be this father of many nations. In verse 19, it says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. It gives us this picture that Abraham's thinking, listen, if this is what God wants me to do, then this is what I'm going to do. The Lord has been absolutely faithful in my life over and over and over again. And I cannot do anything but trust. And that's what we've been singing about this, this faithful God this morning too. I think it's been so appropriate that, that he's like, this is the God who I serve and he's been completely faithful. So if he tells me to sacrifice my son, I'm gonna sacrifice my son. And if I go through with it, I can trust that God could even raise the dead. And I'm sure that this situation for Abraham was probably the most difficult thing that he'd ever done, the most emotionally wrenching horribly hard against everything that he wanted to do. But we can see this really clear picture that his confidence that God's will and way is best, his faith, his confidence that God's will and way was best was paired with his works or an action that completed 
inner intention. Okay, and before we jump back into that justified idea, we're going to read the story of Rahab as well that James gives us. And that starts in James chapter 2, verses 25 through 26. 25, it says, And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. To further underline this idea of how faith and works have to, to go together and, and the beautiful thing that happens when they, when they are working in tandem, he tells us a story about Rahab. Now the story about Abraham, that's kind of a gimme. Like for the Jewish faith, you're like, okay, Abraham, that makes sense. He's the, the patriarch. Like he is the father of the nation. Like we, we're tracking with you on Abraham. But then he tells a story about Rahab and you're a little bit more like, well, like, okay, like she's not even an Israelite. Like she, she wasn't an Israelite. She's not one of the Jewish people. She's a foreigner. And she's a woman. So it was less likely he'd tell a story about her being a woman. And then also what's even less likely is because the Rahab, and probably, you know, as I've heard this week and study a little bit too, it's most likely out, from circumstances outside of her original control, she has to make her living by being a prostitute. So we have a foreign woman who's a prostitute, and this is a story that, Abra that James is now going to tell us about, but it's super cool. Listen to this. Okay, so the, what happens is that these spies, so it's the story of Joshua. This is coming out of Joshua 2. That Joshua, they're going to they're gonna check out the land of Jericho so they can overtake it. And so Joshua sends in two spies into the land of Jericho. And when the spies go in, they end up staying at Rahab's house, right? And it's Rahab's house that these spies like hide out in, and, and what happens is that word comes to the city officials or whoever, you know, that two spies have snuck in and they're going to try and take the, to check out Jericho. So they send these men to Rahab's house. And when they get there, Rahab hides these guys under flax that is sitting on top of her roof. Maybe it's drying out on top of the roof and she hides the spies under the, under the flax. And the men come to her house and she's like, well, that's a bummer. They're not here anymore. They were here. We had some tea. They left. And they're outside. So she says, like, go look for him out there. And so they go out looking for the men. And she goes up to talk to the spies. And she says, listen, after three days, they're going to give up looking for you because you're not out there. You're up here. Uh, and when they do, then it'll be safe for you to leave. And when Rahab does this, there's no doubt that she has just now put at risk her life and the lives of everyone that lives in her household. And we later, she talks about her parents and her, her sister or brother. Like, there, she has family and she has just put her life and their lives at risk. But when she goes up, this is the coolest part. She goes up on the roof to talk to the spies, uh, the Israelite spies, and this is what she says to them that are hiding under the flax. She says, I know that the Lord your God is the God in heaven above and on earth below. And this is where we get this really cool peek into Rahab's life. Even though she's like this unusual suspect, I love it because somewhere along the line, because earlier she's talking to these spies, she says, listen, we have been melting in fear of the Israelites. Like we, we know that your God is God and that he does like big and powerful and crazy stuff. And like the whole city is like freaking out about it. And we're like, we have no idea what's going to happen. We were afraid something's going to happen. And we know that he's real. And she has actually placed her faith and her trust in the Lord somewhere along the line. And it's because she has placed her faith and trust in the Lord that she hides these spies on her roof. Okay, so let's talk about the word justification because I got stuck here because this part of the passage is talking about Abraham and it's talking about Rahab and it's saying that they were justified by their faith. We'll, we'll read over those uh, two verses again. Uh, in verse 23, it says, uh, And scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Okay, uh, did I capture all the ones that said, okay, I did. All right, so this is what I want to talk about. I got stuck here because the way I've always understood the word justified to mean was to be declared righteous. This is the way that the Apostle Paul, who wrote so much of the New Testament, talks about the word justified. So I was, I was with James, and he's saying like, hey, you have faith, that's good. Real faith is going to have works that go along with it. But then somewhere here he says, hey, you know, like if you have works, your works actually can, will justify you. That's what happened with Abraham. That's what happened to Rahab. And I'm like, whoa, you mean I could be declared righteous by my works? And that, that doesn't jive with anything that, that Paul is saying. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he says, for by grace you're saved through faith and not by works. It's a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. 
So then I was just kind of stuck here. And uh, Becky Johnson actually passed a, a Jen Wilkin podcast to me this week. And I was reading in William Barclay in a commentary. And they both said the same thing. And it, it like my brain like kind of exploded and I was, everything was, was good. So I want to bring you with me. So here's what Paul is talking about when he uses the word justified. Paul and James are using the exact same word, but they're using the words in, with different meanings. The same term, different meanings. Paul uses the word justified to mean to be declared righteous, right? The, the, he's talking about the start of the Christian faith. Paul's talking about people who have no relationship with God. And when you enter into a relationship with the living God, then Jesus, then God says, listen, as you place your faith in my son, as you place your faith in what Jesus Christ has done on your behalf, the works of Jesus then are attributed to you, right? Like we, we take on Jesus' holiness, his perfection. And he takes on, he, as he took on our sin on the cross and God sees us in right standing with him. We are justified. He sees us in right standing with him because of the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. That happens when we enter into a relationship with, with Jesus for the first time. Yes? Yeah? Okay, good. All right. So what James is talking about is not that. James says justified, but James is talking to who's his audience? He's talking to Christians, right? And he's saying, he's like, I'm not talking about the starting point of the Christian faith. I'm talking about people who already know and are walking with Jesus, people who have already been declared righteous. To them, James is saying, I'm using the word justified to mean to be shown as righteous. And then I said, Oh, it all makes complete sense. This is how William Barclay says it. He says, uh, the difference between James and Paul is a difference of the starting point. Paul starts with the great basic fact of the forgiveness of God, which no man can earn or win or deserve. I'm like, yes, okay, I'm with you on that. And James starts with the professing Christian. And he insists that unless a man proves his Christianity by his deeds, he's not a Christian at all. We are all saved uh, we, are, we are not saved by our deeds, which agrees with Paul, but we are saved for deeds, is what William says. So then I, I thought, okay, this makes completely sense. So let's, re, let's look at Abraham and Rahab's stories in those terms. Okay, so Abraham is shown as righteous. He's shown, the way James says it, he's shown to be righteous. He's shown as, as, as righteous. He's justified in Genesis 22 when he's ready to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar because all the way back in Genesis 15, when the Lord came to Abraham and said, you're going, to have, you're going to have a son, you're going to be the father of many nations, it says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Because Abraham had already placed his faith in God and God had declared him righteous, then he could be shown as righteous by his works in Genesis 22. The same thing is true of Rahab. We see Rahab, when she hides these spies, it says that she's shown as righteous. Because guess what, guys? She doesn't go up to the roof and talk to the spies under the flax. And they're like, hey, uh, or, you know, when they get to her house, like, the, the spies don't say, hey, you know, there's some guys are looking for us. And uh, can we convert you to Judaism right now? Would that be great? Like, would you like to believe in the Lord? That's not what happens. I think that when, God, when the Lord sent the spies to Rahab's house, I think he sent them there very specifically because when Joshua was saying, hey, we need to send spies into the land, maybe the Lord's like, you know, this is going to be awesome because Rahab, she lives on the city wall and she loves me and she fears me. And it's going to be super cool. Like, I bet she's going to hide them under some flax. You know, I don't know. Like, you know, I mean, the Lord knows. But this is not like how I believe he talks. But, but I, I just think that, that the Lord was excited because she already had faith and trust in the living God. And so they go to her house, not, by, not just by happenstance, right? They wind up at Rahab's house because the Lord sent them there and she hides them under the flax because she has faith in the Lord. They're, she wasn't converted at that point. And her hiding them under the flax didn't declare her righteous. It showed that she was righteous. You tracking with me? Okay, great. So here's what I want to do for a second. I want to talk about recycling. Okay, you'll see. All right, all right. So let's talk about recycling for a second. Our family recycles. You, can, you don't have to clap. It's all right. All right. So sometimes it's not a lot of extra work, right? We're just breaking down a box. We're rinsing out a jar. Have you ever had that moment where you're rinsing out a jar for so long? You're thinking, am I, is it better to rinse this jar out or recycle? Because I've spent so much water cleaning the tomato sauce out of this. Anybody? No? I don't know. Okay. You know, so anyway, but we recycle. And when we do that, we rinse stuff out. We break stuff down. Sometimes I put, then my wife's like, that is not, you can't put that. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, or the kids, they just throw stuff. But we put stuff in a recycling bin. It's a red bin in our pantry. We take that bin out to uh, the bin that's on the side of our house with the yellow lid. We dump it in there. And on the appropriate day, we take that out to the curb. That's, that's recycling. Here's the deal about recycling. I am not recycling just by saying that I like recycling. 
I'm not recycling just by preaching about recycling. I'm not recycling just by having a, a green bumper sticker with the white arrows that go around in a circle on the back of my car. I wouldn't even be recycling if I was friends with Al Gore on Facebook and we chatted about recycling on Facebook, right? And environmental awareness or whatever. That would not be recycling. Actually taking things and putting them in the bin and putting the bin on, uh, on the curb when it's time for the truck to come is recycling. I have to participate in the process of recycling to be recycling. As followers of Jesus, we are declared righteous through our faith, but we are shown to be righteous through our works. Being a follower of Jesus means both believing that his will and his way is best, but also acting on it. They have to go together. There's no way around it. If you and I are going to follow Jesus, we will participate in his kingdom come, his will be done on earth. We will submit ourselves to the way of Jesus as well as we live. I heard this definition of a disciple uh, in the last couple months, and I just thought it was so good and so appropriate for this. It's this, that a disciple of Jesus is someone who listens to his voice and obeys. It's simple, but I think it's so profound for us today to, to really be disciples of Jesus. What James is saying, he's, listen, you can have faith. Like, it's great to trust that God is who he says he is, but it cannot stop there. Our belief in the living God has to follow through with works and actions that actually come out of a life of belief. So following Jesus means that I both listen to his voice, but then I'm obedient with my life. And Jen Wilkin, who I referenced earlier, she describes it this way. She says, we are saved by grace through faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. I'm going to say it again because it's so good. We are saved by grace through faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace we're saved by faith. We are saved by grace through faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. We are not adding works to our faith, but genuine faith will include works. So here's not what I'm saying. I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe that James is saying if, if you don't do everything absolutely perfect in every single way in your life, if you have not always perfectly listened and obeyed at every point, is, is God saying that, that you're not a follower of his, you're not with him. I don't think that's what James is saying. But James is saying, as we're talking to people who are Christians, he's saying like, listen, if we are following Jesus then we are going to live like Jesus. And so as we examine ourselves, we need to say, listen, God, I, I want to, if I'm a, your follower, I need to be obedient as you speak to me. And so the majority of what I've been talking about and who I've been talking to this morning, just like James, I'm taking his text and I'm saying, listen, he's talking to, to Christians. I've been talking to Christians today. If you, if you know and love and are walking with Jesus, that's mainly who I've been, been talking to. But if, there, if you can hear my voice today and, and, you, have, and you are not in a, believing relationship with Jesus Christ, I do want you to hear this. There's a lot of, there are, I think there are people out there that would say, listen, I'm not a Christian because I know a Christian. And the Christian I know, his life or her life hasn't really matched up. Like what they said they believed and what they actually did didn't seem to jive with each other. What I want you to hear is that that is not God's desire for us is his, his community. James is saying, if you love Jesus, you're going to live like Jesus. And so if that's you and you've been on that line, I just want to say, listen, if you're in for the kind of faith that we've been talking about, that James is talking about today, then I invite you to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, there's no better time than today to say, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you and I want to walk um, in a relationship with you and I want, to, I want my life to be part of your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If, if that's you today, I, mean, I want, can I encourage you enough, have a conversation. If you're watching online, have a conversation with one of our folks online. If you're in the room or if you're upstairs in the venue, have a conversation with someone today. Have a conversation with one of our staff. Most of them have a green lanyard on. Talk with myself or someone else. We would love to start walking alongside of you in a journey of following God. And, and we want to be a community of people, I hope, at Pathway, where we're saying, listen, we want to move from unbelief to belief in every area of our life. We want to move from, from disobedience to obedience. We want to move in a way of listening and obeying together. Okay, and here's how we're going to kind of wrap up our time real quick. I have four uh, quick steps that we can take. If you're a follower of Christ this morning, uh, there's four quick steps that I think we can take together. The first one is this. It's to examine. Ask the Spirit of God to examine your life. As we've been reading this text, as I've wrestled with this text, trust me, like, when I come up and speak, I'm, I'm like, man, I... I it's a heavy responsibility often. And I, and I feel like as I'm looking at this text, I'm saying, Jesus, like how, how well have I done personally at listening and obeying to you? I know there's definitely some points in my life where I've listened and I've obeyed, but I know there's also points in my life where I've listened or I haven't listened well, or sometimes we, we kind of almost like dull in our ears to the voice of Jesus. How connected have your faith in Jesus and your obedience to Jesus been? 
How have you been partnering in his kingdom? How have you been at work in joining Jesus and restoring all things the way that he designed them to be? Have you been obedient to his word? Have you been obedient to his spirit? So examine yourself. Ask God to examine you. The second one is to repent. If you, as you examine yourself, and we're going to give you, give you guys a, a little bit of time this morning. As you've examined your life, maybe this is a moment to repent and say, God, just kind of as I, because I look internally and I ask you to look at my life, I can see that I, maybe I'm kind of drifting. I've kind of gotten in a rhythm of, of not obeying right away the way that you've called me to or, or sort of listening but not following through. Jesus, like, I want, I want to be obedient. So maybe this is time to say, God, I'm going to turn from that way to, to a new way. The, the third one is request. Ask the Spirit of God to soften your heart. This idea of faith, man, it would bring joy to the Lord's heart for us to say to him as his people today, God, would you please embirth some new faith in me? Would you, please, would you please stir something up in me, something fresh in me to follow you and, and to listen to your voice well? God, if there's been stuff that I've, as I've been blocking out your voice, would you please just kind of push all that away so I can clearly hear your voice, so I can clearly obey? And the last is to respond. It's to listen and obey. As God speaks to you, as God leads you, respond with obedient action. Let's not just be people who hear the voice of God, but let's be people who hear the voice of God and are moved to action together. So what we're going to do in the next few moments is this. The band and the worship team is is up here. They're going to lead us uh, in a song over the next few moments. They're going to do the same thing upstairs in the venue. As they lead us over this song, I just want to invite you just to make space for the Spirit of God to work in your life. Ask the Lord to help you examine your heart. If he moves you to, then repent. Like this is a time to, to, to he's a, such a safe place. Maybe this is, you're just going to be encouraged by him, but as you need to request that the spirit of God embirths fresh and new faith in us and then respond by listening to him and moving to action. And then they're going to sing this over us and I invite you to sing with them if you want to or just to make space to listen to the voice of God. And then we'll wrap up our time with prayer together this morning.
Jesus, help us to be a people who listen to your voice and respond with obedient action. God, we trust that you are a good and a faithful God. Lord, you are a God that, that we can trust, that we can obey, that we can walk in obedient action to because, God, you are so trustworthy. God, we confess, Lord, as a people that often we don't lean in and we don't listen well. Jesus, we repent. If we have not done that, God, we want to turn from, from closed ears to being people with open ears, God, that will we'll hear your voice and that we'll, we'll live out, God, what you've called us to. Jesus, forgive us for that. Jesus, please speak to us in fresh ways. I just ask that over this community of believers, Jesus, that you would speak to us by your spirit, that you would move in us, that you would stir our hearts. And God, we ask that as you move, that we would be an obedient people. May it be said of anyone that is part of Pathway, God, that we are a people who hear your voice and we act. God, you are good. We pray this in the power of your name, Jesus. Amen. Guys, if you are new to Pathway, if you have questions about your next steps here um, in our community of faith or steps, or questions about Jesus and your relationship with him, we would love to answer those. We would love to help you out. If you're online, the folks online would love to chat with you about that. If you're here in the room or upstairs in the venue, um, any of our staff or folks at Next Steps would love to help you on your journey with Jesus. God bless you guys. Have a great week.
Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the Give button on the web or the app or text the word GIVE. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at-home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.